it was during the retreat of the 80,000 and the authority of the censorship is sufficient excuse for not being more explicit. But it was on the most awful day of that awful time, on the day when ruin and disaster came so near that their shadow fell over London far away. And without any certain news, the hearts of men failed them and grew faint, as if the agony of the army in the battlefield had entered their souls. On this dreadful day then, when 300,000 men in arms, with all their artillery, swelled like a flood against the little English company, there was one point above all other points in our battle line that was for a time in awful danger, not merely of defeat, but of utter annihilation. With the permission of the censorship and of the military expert, this corner may perhaps be described as a salient. And if this angle were crushed and broken, then the English force as a whole would be shattered. The Allied left would be turned and Sedan would inevitably follow. All the morning, the German guns had thundered and shrieked against this corner and against the thousand or so men who held it. The men joked at the shells and found funny names for them and had bets about them and greeted them with scraps of music or songs. But the shells came on and burst and tore good Englishmen limb from limb and tore brother from brother. And as the heat of the day increased, so did the fury of that terrific cannonade. There was no help, it seemed. The English artillery was good, but there was not nearly enough of it. It was being steadily battered into scrap iron. There comes a moment in a storm at sea when people say to one another, it is at its worst, it can blow no harder, and then there is a blast ten times more fierce than any before it, and so it was in these British trenches. There were no stouter hearts in the whole world than the hearts of these men, but even they were appalled as this seven times heated hell of the German cannonade fell upon them and overwhelmed them and destroyed them. And at this very moment, they saw from their trenches that a tremendous host was moving against their lines. 500 of the thousand remained, and as far as they could see, the German infantry was pressing on against them, column upon column, a grey world of men, 10,000 of them, as it appeared afterwards. There was no hope at all. They shook hands, some of them. One man improvised a new version of the battle song, Goodbye, Goodbye to Tipperary, ending it with, And we shan't get there. And they all went on, firing steadily. The officer pointed out that such an opportunity for high-class fancy shooting might never occur again. The Tipperary humorist asked, What price Sydney Street? and the few machine guns did their best, but everybody knew that it was no use. The dead grey bodies lay in companies and battalions as others came on and on and on, and they swarmed and stirred and advanced from beyond and beyond. World without end, amen, said one of the British soldiers with some irrelevance as he took aim and fired. And then he remembered he says that he cannot think why or wherefore. A queer vegetarian restaurant in London where he had once or twice eaten eccentric dishes of cutlets made of lentils and nuts that pretended to be steak. Now on all the plates in this restaurant was printed a figure of St George in blue with the motto Adsit Angli Sanctus Georgus. May St George be a present help to the English. Now the soldier happened to know Latin and other useless things. And now, as he fired at his man in the grey advancing mass, 300 yards away, he uttered the pious vegetarian motto. He went on firing to the end. And at last, Bill on his right had to clout him cheerfully over the head to make him stop, pointing out that the king's ammunition cost money and it was not to be wasted drilling funny patterns into dead Germans. For as the Latin scholar uttered his invocation, he felt something between a shudder and an electric shock pass through his body. The roar of the battle died down in his ears to a gentle murmur, and instead of it, he says, he heard a great voice, a shout, 
louder than a thunder peal, crying, Array! 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 His heart grew hot as a burning coal. It grew cold as ice within him, as it seemed to him that a tumult of voices answered to his summons. He heard, or seemed to hear, thousands shouting, St George! St George! St George for Merry England! Harrow! Harrow! Monseigneur St George, succour us! Heaven's knight, aid us! And as the soldier heard these voices, he saw before him, beyond the trench, a long line of shapes with a shining about them. They were like men who drew the bow, and with another shout their cloud of arrows flew, singing and tingling through the air towards the German hosts. Now the other men in the trench were firing all the while. They had no hope, but they aimed just as they'd been shooting at Bisley, and suddenly one of them lifted up his voice in the plainest English. God help us, he said to the man next to him. We're blooming marvels. Look at those grey gentlemen. Look at them. They're going down in their thousands. Look, there's a whole regiment gone down while I'm talking to you. What are you guessing about, the other soldier said, taking aim. But he gulped with astonishment even as he spoke. For indeed, the grey men were falling by the thousands. The English could hear the guttural scream of the German officers, the crackle of their revolvers as they shot the reluctant, and still line after line crashed to the earth. And all the while, the Latin-bred scholar heard the cry, Harrow! Harrow! St George, help us! High Chevalier, defend us! The singing arrows fled, so swift and thick that they darkened the air and the heathen horde melted from before them. In fact, there were 10,000 dead German soldiers left before the salient of the English army and consequently there was no Sedan. That in Germany, a country ruled by scientific principles, the great general staff decided that the contemptible English must have employed shells containing an unknown gas of the dead German soldiers. But the man who knew what nuts tasted like when they called themselves steak knew also that St George had brought his Agincourt bowmen to help the English.